So welcome everyone to this edition of the Verifiability Talk. It's my honor to introduce our speaker, Thomas Wright. He got his PhD at Edinburgh with Ian Stark and then moved on to uh, become a research associate at York with Jim Woodcock, uh, where he's working on, on the Verifiability Node, among others. And he will report on some joint research, uh, of course, with Jim, but also with uh, Claudia Gomez from Aarhus University, which is about digital twins. Uh, thank you very much, Thomas, for having accepted our invitation. Just a note, this meeting is going to be recorded and posted on YouTube. So if you don't want, want your name to appear, you could join us uh, as a guest and uh, turn off your camera and everything should be fine. Thank you again, Thomas, and the floor is yours. Thank you for that, Mohammed. Today I will be presenting formally verified self-adaptation of an incubator digital twin, which will be presented later this month at um, ISA 2020. So, so this work concerns digital twinning. In contrast, most work on verification uses a classic model-based engineering approach, which takes the live system we want to verify it works correctly, performs some modeling activity to create a, a structured offline model which then all types of simulation, verification, and testing are carried out on the offline model. And they only influence the running system periodically based on whole updates to the design of the system when we learn new insights based on our verification activities. In contrast, in a digital twinning system, we use the model we want and to represent the system online and establish bi-directional communication by which the digital twin actively gets data from and then influences the running system. So what is a digital twin? Firstly, a digital twin is quite simply a digital clone of a physical system. This can include bi-directional system with communication with the actual running system, and the type of model which is used in a digital twin, like offline models, depends both on the system domain and the level of abstraction we desire. So this could include 3D simulations, as is the case for the TAS um, robot assisted dressing case study, or it could also include more abstract mathematical models such as sets of equations or systems of ordinary differential equations. And for realistic systems, we need co-simulations, which take lots of different types of models appropriate to different components of the system and run them together. So the use of a digital twin at runtime can address the potential for drift between offline models and running systems, but also adds in the ability to actively inform and modify the system behavior at runtime. So when deploying digital twins, we want to address a number of real design challenges for systems. The first is that these systems need to operate under environmental uncertainties. So this is when unpredictable shifts in the environment of the system can come along and invalidate the assumptions made at design time. So one approach to addressing this using a digital twin is self-adaptation, whereby the digital twin in, is recalibrated and, and makes adaptations based to correct the system behavior when the environment changes. However, uh, we also need it to ensure that digital twinning systems can be used safely, which requires formal verification and that the behavior of a digital twinning system meets its design specifications. And even more so than classical um, control systems, digital twinning systems are difficult to verify given we not only need to consider the behavior of the actual running system, but the model we've made of it actively influences the system behavior. So we need to verify the model's interactions with the real world. 
also specifically self-adaptation and poses difficult verification challenges and it's currently unsuited for use in safety critical systems each each time the system makes an adaptation and it invalidates prior offline verification of the system and then and we when the environment changes we would need a expensive recertification process for the whole system um, before the adaptation can be deployed. So in this talk, we propose an approach to address these challenges where we augment the use of a digital twin with online model checking to provide verifiably self-adaptations. Self we use signal temporal logic as a space specification language for the safety properties of the system and we employ sound model checking techniques based on verified monitoring of these properties over flow pipes produced by the Flowstar verified integrator and we'll explore this approach with a case study of a model incubator digital twin system. So first I'll tell you a little bit about the incubator digital twin system. So this system consists of a incubator box where we have a box with some contents which we're trying to keep at a constant temperature, in our case, 41 degrees. And this is achieved by the use of a electric heat bed it, within the box, which adds the heat, a fan which ensures a uniform temperature distribution inside the box and several temperature sensors at different locations within the box, which give us data about the current state of the environment and also a temperature sensor outside of the box. And all of this comes together to try and, and maintain the temperature and hence preserve the important contents of the box. So alongside that system, we need models in order to form the digital twin. And in particular, we are aiming to choose a control policy for the heater, which serves to maintain the temperature of the box. So this depends on the two components of our digital twin. Firstly, we have a mathematical model in the form of two coupled different ordinary differential equations for temperature variables representing the temperature at the heater itself inside the box and also for the air temperature of the air inside the box. And these are linked by the following differential equations, which include the heat capacity is C heater and C air for the um, air in the for the heater itself and the air in the box and they depend on the voltage and current and of the heater and and there is how include a feedback loop in between the air in the box and the heater governed by these heat transfer rates g heater and g box so this is quite an abstract model of the box, and, but it's been validated both against the real system and against more complete computational fluid dynamic simulations of the box. But crucially, this also depends on control input, CT at each instance of time, which, deter, which is either one or zero and determines whether the heat is on or off. This is governed by a open loop controller, uh, which starts at, in an initialization state and then oscillates between heating or cooling for fixed periods of time. And this control, this control state machine corresponds to a periodic control function, CT, which oscillates between uh, heating for k time units and then calling off for n time units, effectively turning the heater on and off 
based on these fixed parameters. So I'll now tell you about the verification techniques we need in order to um, verify the safety of the system, which depend on verified monitoring of STL properties over hybrid systems. So hybrid systems verification rem and remains a very challenging problem with many different techniques which work for some systems at some scales those in order to get the best possible results out for verification. One leading approach is the Flowstar Verified Integrator, which, which given a specific hybrid system performs verified integration to produce a flow pipe, which is a complex symbolic representation of the reachable states of the system and does its best to over approximate every possible true solution of the system in a conservative way. So whilst verified integrators such as Flowstar have traditionally focused on so-called reach avoidance properties, which states that from a given starting state, <clears throat> all solutions will be contained in a certain region. Um, for realistic verification, we need much richer languages to talk about what our specifications for what the system is allowed to do. Um, for this, we use signal temporal logic, which provides a rich temporal logic based specification language, which consists of um, inequalities over the atomic propositions consisting of different system variables, um, conjunctions of different temporal logic properties, disjunction, and negation, as well as temporal operators such as eventually between a bounded time window a b which states that property phi must be true between a and b time units in the future uh, at some point and also the globally a b which states that at every single point within this window in the future uh, the given property must hold and in order to apply STL verification to Flowstar flow pipes, we use an approach introduced in my PhD thesis um, and also in this paper, with, which provides a full STL monitoring algorithm based on Flowstar uh, flow pipes. So, I'll now tell you a little bit about this monitoring algorithm. So where was the original STL monitoring algorithm introduced by Marlon and Nikovic? Used Boolean signals, S, which are functions which take the time domain to either true or false and provide a compositional way to perform approximate monitoring based on numerical traces or time series from either a model or a running system. Um, however, given we're interested in sound verification, we use three valued signals, which take the time domain in between naught and infinity to either true or false, but also the third truth value unknown when we do not have enough information to either verify or refute a given property. And this provides a basis for sound monitoring and allows us to um, apply this, this method to flow star flow pipes, encapsulating both any uncertainty introduced during the monitoring process, but also underlying uncertainties in the model itself. And in a little bit more detail, this monitoring algorithm approaches atomic propositions, which compare some function of the system state variables to a constant and, and uh, produces a free valued signal based on um, interval numerical methods which bound each of the changes of sign in of the atomic proposition composed with the flow pipe, 
which gives us each of the unknown regions and which after which we are guaranteed to have consistent truth values it was in the rest of the signal so we can just look at the just evaluate the atomic proposition over the flow pipe to fill in the rest of the signal now on top of this in order to scalably and precisely give monitoring results else we in evaluating the atomic proposition we use a hybrid um numerical and symbolic evaluation approach to give the best quality signals at a reasonable monitoring cost so working in a bottom-up manner once we've acquired signals for each of the atomic propositions we combine these in a compositional way to deduce signals for complex propositions so for example if we have signals for phi and psi then we can combine in get signals for the logical conjunction and by combining the um combining the false regions and the true regions in a conservative manner and similarly for um phi or psi whereas for the um temporal operators as we need to shift the um true and false regions backwards and outwards for the true regions and inwards for the false regions and to conservatively match the semantics of stl and this method as well as the basic top-down monitoring algorithm also introduced a second so in addition to the basic bottom-up monitoring algorithm we also introduced a top-down approach called masks which reduced the cost of monitoring by narrowing down the window of time for the atomic propositions which are actually looked at based on those regions relevant to checking a given atomic proposition within the context of an overall complex formula which is handled by the technique of masks so we can apply this monitoring this whole monitoring algorithm within the context of our incubators twin to obtain signals for a basic safety property t air greater than 22.6 which states that the air temperature within the box should remain in well should at an instant of time be greater than 22.6 degrees centigrade so um with the incubator heater off for the entire duration of time we get the following signal which states that the this property is initially false then is briefly true and then false for the rest of the time duration which corresponds to here the um air temperature of the box here plotted in blue which briefly spikes and then falls however when we actually turn the heater on based on this periodic control policy which turns the heater on for periods of three seconds and then off for periods of seven seconds we get these different results with the heater temperature spiking and then falling which results in the um following in slightly wobbly air temperature within the box which corresponds to the following signal where the property is initially false for a brief period of time and then true for the rest of the time window and whilst directly um, looking at signals for basic properties such as the one on the previous slide gives you a sense of what's happening over time we can also use the full power of the temporal logic to verify more complex properties of the incubator for example we can verify the following property under the control policy uh, c37 we saw before which states that at um at some point 
within the next 2000 time seconds and we will reach a point where the air temperature is between 33 and 36 degrees C and moreover the air temperature will remain at this level for at least 100 seconds and this corresponds to the statement that the air temperature will eventually stabilize and stay within 33 and 36 degrees C. So a classic control theoretic stability property, but with time bounds and on the how long it takes to stabilize and the duration. So now I've shown you the um, basic STL monitoring and verification technology we intend to apply. I'll now talk about its application in this case study to enable verified safe adaptation of the digital twin. So self-adaptation gives us a means to um, deal with unpredictable changes to the system's environment, such as in this case study, if someone were to open the box lid or the external room temperature were to dramatically shift, this would, would um, invalidate many of the parameters of the incubator control policy and hence result in unpredicted behavior of the system. So self-adaptation attempts to resolve these shifts by detecting each of these anomalies as it occurs by comparing output from the digital twin with the real system and then using the updated digital twin to adapt a new control policy which solves the shift and this is carried out by an extended version of the incubator digital twin system which adds in a map k self-adaptation loop which consists of this, this loop, which takes in the sensor data from the physical system, subjects it to mo monitoring, then analysis, and does some planning, and then executes an updated control strategy in the physical system, all based on shared knowledge of the system state. And more specifically, the self-adaptive loop is implemented using a Kalman filter, which predicts the future state values of the system based on the sensor readings and the digital twin model of the system. And then we detect anomalies whenever the Kalman filter output and the sensor readings from the system start to diverge. So once we've detected one of these anomalies, we respond by the following num loop of steps, which is an adaptation of the basic map K model. So we first have a stage where we gather data from the running system, and then we use the data we've collected to perform a optimization, which estimates updated parameters for the digital twin. And we use the updated digital twin in to perform an optimization to compute an optimal control policy, C star, which is then up, uploaded back into the physical controller for the system to match the updated digital twin. So in practice, we can see the, a self-adaptation in response to the disturbance caused by opening the incubator box lid when it's running, which has been shown empirically to correspond to increasing the model parameter G box by a factor of 10. So in response to this anomaly, we see that whilst initially we'd been stabilizing the temperature in the box, when the lift is open, it rapidly drops, but this, corresponds with a anomaly detected um, based on the Kalman filter output, which then causes us to obtain a new control policy whereby the um, heater is kept on all of the time. 
and this raises the temperature inside the box and then stabilizes the box temperature so it still reaches its old target. However, we still need to think about how to ensure safety of this system because um, whilst each of our design, design decisions up to this point have made sense, however, we can see the, that this control policy leads to a state where if we have a second anomaly, such as the lid of the box being closed, then we've maintained the heater inside the box at so high a temperature that there's no control policy that's able to um, cool the heater down quickly enough such that the contents of the box don't rapidly overheat as soon as the lid is closed. And hence, this really highlights the need for more integration of formal methods to understand the design decisions and of the digital twin, but also to be used at runtime in order to detect and remedy such potential failures. So we perform this verification by integrating in our um, hybrid systems S verified STL monitoring approach inside the digital twin self-adaptation loop. As part of this, we first, like the optimization of the digital twin itself, we're going to use the sample data which we've got from the physical system after the anomaly during the gather data stage. And we're going to use this to construct a verifiable model of the system which over approximates both the sample data from the running system and the digital twin of the system and will form a basis for formal verification. We do this via a uncertainty calibration stage where instead of just calibrating the digital twin to the obtain the tightest fit it of to the data from the system, we um, optimize a non-deterministic model which expands the parameters of the digital twin to encompass intervals of uncertainty around the parameter values in order to obtain a safe containment of each of the sample data points within a flow pipe. And more specifically, this is achieved by um, using the flow star to generate flow pipes from a expanded non-deterministic model, wherein each of the model parameters are expanded by a vector of weights, epsilon and delta around the digital twin. And in order to ensure a minimal containment of the sample data, we minimize the function here, which is given based on the degree of non-conformity to the sample data y within a flow pipe it generated from the expanded model, which roughly measures how far these, how far the flow pipe is violated by the points in the sample data. And we also minimize a measure of the total uncertainty in the flow pipe at the end of the gather data time window to ensure this containment is minimal. And overall, this gives us an optimal non-deterministic model M, which encapsulates the system behavior over the gather data stage. This model is then used predictively to conservatively predict the future behavior of the system when we apply flow star verified integration. So we can see in this diagram here after the second anomaly that we've taken the data points from the gather data stage and then um, flow star verified integration gives us these tubes of future system values which do in fact contain the actual behavior of the model uh, and the real system after the anomaly has occurred. And as well as allowing us to 
do reachability analysis and run this system forwards in time. Um, this mon to this non-deterministic model also allows us to apply our verified monitoring to check a list of STL safety properties for the system to verify each self-adaptation is safe. Specifically, we are using the following safety properties for the incubator digital twin. This first property, phi one, is a stabilization property similar to the one I showed earlier, which states that the air temperature in the box should stabilize between 36 and 46 degrees centigrade. The second one is a safety property, which states that the air temperature within the box should always be less than or equal to 60 degrees centigrade. And as the final property, um, we have that the heater temperature should not exceed 70 degrees centigrade. So we can see this monitoring when applied to the incubator system is able to detect the failure we saw earlier. So we see that after the first self-adaptation, both properties phi one and phi two hold in um, accordance with our observation that uh, things seemed fine until after just one self-adaptation. However, we see as before that phi one and phi two fail after the self second self-adaptation when the temperature within the box overheats. Uh, we can also use this monitoring technique to predict it's future failures of the system after a single self-adaptation. So the property phi three, which places a bound on the heater temperature, fails immediately after one self-adaptation, demonstrating its predictive power to um, show that this that as soon as the first self-adaptation has occurred, that the system is heading towards failure. So how do we fix these, this problem in the system now we have our verified monitoring support? One approach to ensuring safety is to use the monitoring results online in an enforcing mode, which it, whilst it cannot tell us how to redesign the system in order to optimally mitigate the failure, we can, however, perform a safe shutdown of the incubator as soon as we've detected an unsafe self-adaptation, which whilst not perfect, um, allows us to at least operate more safely and an, than a non-self-adaptive system um, and could allow humans to manually intervene. So in the enforcing mode, we see as soon as the first property fails, else we immediately shut off the incubator to ensure safety. However, we can also use the results from our monitoring to inform improvements to the overall design of the incubator. So this figure shows the incubator with an updated control strategy, which places a limit on the total heat to temperature that the, can be obtained in when choosing the control strategy. And we see that under this updated control policy, whilst the um, functional property um, phi one of stabilization can't be satisfied. However, each of the key safety properties phi two and, and phi three are now maintained. And this is an example of an important design problem in self-adaptive systems. Namely, given that self-adaptation needs to be able to handle unpredicted shifts in environment, we can't say ahead of time in that we will be able to satisfy all functional requirements. And as at some point, you're just going to move outside of the design limits of the hardware components of the system. However, uh, we can trade off the different design requirements in order to ensure that safety is maintained. So in conclusion, um, 
the incubator twin case study covers many interesting design and safety aspects of real digital twinning systems. Whilst Flowstar and verified STL monitoring in provides a powerful verification tool hit, it, which we're able to apply to the case study and, and ultimately achieve safety under self-adaptation, which also allows us to predict future violations of the system before they actually occur. And all of this rests on our ability to um, calibrate the non-deterministic model, which it bounds the uncertainty in the underlying model based on the data from the system and provides a basis for sound formal verification. So some limitations of this approach are the fact that the accuracy of our predictions are, based, are limited based on the quality of the sensor data from the system. However, we could improve upon this by combining the results from the multiple sensors at different locations within the box to give an even more conservative model based on the full range of sensor readings. We also may, in a more realistic setting, may need to deal with potential differences of timing between the physical and the system and the digital twin caused by communication delays. For this, we could look at using more sophisticated notions of model conformance, such as the Shokharov metric or dy dynamic time warping. Um, more practically, the stage of performing Flowstar verified integration online is expensive, which would limit the ability of this technique to be applied in cases where we need a very timely result from the monitoring stage. However, we're looking at methods of pre-computing the Flowstar flow pipes offline in which would enable much more performance and online verification. And finally, it would be interesting to see to what extent this, these techniques apply to other case studies and digital twinning systems. Okay, thank you. That's the end of my talk. And now I welcome any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Thomas. So I see that Alvaro already raised his hand. So Alvaro, please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear yes. you. Yes. Cool. Uh, so two questions. One, and you may have said, and I have missed it, uh, but can you pri kind of prioritize the um, uh, some of your properties? For example, could you say that not heating 60 degrees is more important than uh, keeping the temperature within that tighter bound? So in the current implementation, we can do this in enforcing mode because we can say only some of our properties when violated should trigger a shutdown of the system. However, we don't yet have a more granular but way you to can't, trade off between the different properties. You can't, uh, like, uh, I don't know, um, optimize the, 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 your solution, putting more weight on one of the properties than on the other. Um, that would be something to look at um, if this was extended to actually synthesizing control policies, which ensure the safety properties. Okay. At the moment, yeah. the optimization is done um, based on the digital twin itself. And then the verification just gives you a yes, no answer on yeah. top of that. Uh, cool. That extension could be. I think Alvaro, to yeah, I just wanted to thank Alvaro for the very interesting question because um, this is actually uh, becomes very interesting because the system, uh, as you see, when we open the lid, the controller cannot fulfill. So in many situations, we want the system to continue to operate, but in a degraded mode, and we want to know which which are properties that are really a hard no, and which ones are like okay, well, they cannot do anything about it. So that's very cool. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, and one other thing was, so do you need to uh, uh, pre kind of predict what this 
anomalies might be. So does your mo it sounds like your model knows that one of the problems would be opening the box or not, because you know that uh, the scale of, of, of the conductivity, uh, heat conductivity of the changes. So what would happen, for example, if with the system as it is, somebody took a, uh, I don't know, a throw and put on top of your incubator, would your system react in, a, in an interesting way? So I think the way the optimization works is if whatever change is made to the system does correspond to a change in the model parameters, then the optimization can deal with this in a fairly interruption agnostic manner. However, this of course depends on the scope of different parameterizations of the model to match given behavior. So yeah, there's obvious limitations once we move outside of, of perturbations which are consistent with the basic structure of the model. Claudio. Claudio. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I think uh, it, this is another great interesting direction to go because you could build up, uh, you could analyze the model symbolically and understand, okay, these are the parameters. And, and so uh, from the point of view of the model, the things it supports is disturbances in the parameters and disturbances on the inputs. Now you, you may have stuff that's not being uh, modeled per se, like uh, for example, we assume the temperature is uniform, but if you suddenly go in and insert a, a, a plate in the incubator separating one section with the heat bed and from another, it's going to be much diff much more difficult to model this. So uh, we could use some some kind of uh, Thomas. I think in the future it would be interesting if we could do some some kind of design space exploration, uh, mm. uh, building all all possible anomalies that the model can actually detect uh, and then use these to, to create better monitors um, without us having to, you know, expect some anomalies to happen. Yes, indeed, that would be very nice. Would be interesting. I know, so in the, when doing the uh, related work for the paper, I did look at various um, papers taking more symbolic um, approach to self-adaptive systems, which we're looking at, say, process algebra and models of networks and various network topology reconfigurations, which would be, I guess, one class of structural reconfiguration to the model. But yes, I think in terms of using ODE models, we'd be more restricted to looking at design space expertise and just what are the bounds. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the, the presentation and the work sound very interesting. Cheers. Thank you very much, Alvaro. You are uh, more than welcome to join us. Uh, we need more, <laughs> we need more hands on this. Are there further questions? Yes, Anna, please go ahead. Anna, you're muted. We can't hear you. Yes, 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 yes. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you very much for the presentation, Thomas. I think there's something that I misunderstood that from what you said to Alvaro, actually. I understood from your slides that you, when you, dis you, you identified an anomaly, I thought you were using a common filter that's not either part of the system or part of the digital twin. The common field is comparing them, and when you detect that there is a problem, then you would do some experimentation, optimization with the digital twin. And once the digital, you're happy with the digital twin, then you transfer to the real system. So in a sense, you are synthesizing, in or exp at least experimenting, synthesizing control on your digital twin before you throw it to the real system. Is that right? Yes, that's. Correct. Okay, so in that sense, you, you could do this prioritization that I was talking about, could play with it in the digital domain before you throw it to the real system, yeah? Yes, we could do that okay. on the digital twin level. Right. However, the temporal logic 
verification side of things, that's a layer on top of everything which happens with the basic digital twin. Okay, so you're not using the verification as part of this optimization process that will generate the 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 the, the new control policy. Is no, that right? so that's something. So a different approach to this would be to integrate the temporal logic properties into the optimization, for example, using numerical monitoring and a quantitative degree of satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And that would provide a more integrated approach to the optimization and the verification. All right. OK, and, and forgive me if my question is naive. I'm not a control theorist, but I understood from your, from your example that you had a very nice situation where you could fix one problem and then create a control policy that if another problem happens, there is no solution for it in the future. And therefore, you want to do a different approach by experiment with the digital twin. How do you do the bounding of time? Because how, how do you know that you have verified for enough time? Because the problem may not occur in the next however many time units you put there, but why occur in the next one? How do you play with that? There must be some assumptions of continuity in some way that you make. I think, at least in this case study, this was based on um, essentially experiments which Claudio did with just looking yeah, at the can, system and seeing. Yeah, I can take on that one, Thomas. Uh, I think uh, it's a good, very good, very sharp eyes, Anna. I think uh, here we we know the system is passive, uh, not in this passive. We're pumping energy into the system, but there is uh, there is a sink in the room, so that we, we we assume that the room doesn't warm up as the system warms up. So there is a we know there's always a stable uh, at a, there's always a stable temperature, and we know from experiments that it usually takes a hundred seconds to get there. Okay. Uh, so we use that knowledge. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And that's how you justify that that particular property with those particular time bounds. It's bound enough. Yeah. Is, is enough. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Mohammed, do you want me to shut up or can I ask more questions? Absolutely. We have 10 more minutes. So please go ahead. All right. Okay. So, okay. My just can I just quickly add a bit to the previous okay. answer to say that? As part of my thesis, I did look at some cases of unbounded time verification using um, combining this technique with quantifier elimination to show conserved regions of the system dynamics. So it is possible to, in some special cases, get unbounded time guarantees, yeah. but this is in practice quite difficult to scale and would be very difficult to use online in this manner, just given the cost and the fact that this requires often some quite system specific reasoning. So okay. can't be yet be used in a um, just plug in the system manner, such as model checkers. OK, thank you. That's, That's, very interesting. That's very interesting to know. My final question, I promise, uh, is about Flow Star. Um, mm. We have had with your kind guidance, quite a bad time trying to use Flow Star to deal with hybrid systems. Mm -hmm. And you seem to be extremely successful. Is your Flow Star model really hybrid, or are you doing just continuous in Flow Star? And what makes a hybrid is perhaps combination with other models. Why is Flow Star kind to you and horrible to James? Um, I think part of it is being very selective with what case studies you try it on as, as I guess quite a dividing line on what it can handle and what it can't. This particular module is a hy hybrid system due to the control loop. However, in the actual code, my STL monitoring code only uses the continuous part of um, Flowstar and I built some extra high code to do control systems on top of that, just as that was the um, quickest way to implement it for the systems we wanted for this work. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Thomas. So I will also say there is, since the version I was working with, a new version of Flowstar 
on GitHub, which seems to be much improved in performance and scalability. So um, maybe this will solve some of the problems. Unless it's very recent, you know, the last month or so, it didn't help, fortunately. Uh, thank I'm you. Afraid, and yeah, I'm afraid hybrid systems verification for non-linear systems really is a bit of a um, yes. limit, limited in scalability at, at stands. I think yeah. the linear systems really took a decade of research before that really started working in scaling, which um, may also be the case for nonlinear systems. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, work. Thank you for all. Congratulations, all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Alvar, I take that your hand is an old one, not a new one, right? Um, are there any further questions? I could ask one or two, given the time. Uh, so, so I, am I right that you assume that your system does not take any significant inputs um, because uh, I, I don't see anywhere in your monitoring algorithm where, where you may want to feed the system with, with say, the most the input that is most likely to reveal a fault. Is that the case or? Like, suppose you could open the incubator door for some time and leave it open and then close it after some time. These type of inputs that could reveal different types of faults in the system, are they things that you can handle in your monitoring mechanism or? So in this work, we haven't considered that kind of um, time variable inputs. However, in my thesis, I introduce a another temporal logic, the logic for behavior in uncertain contexts, which is able to formulate um, timed interruption properties, which essentially extends STL with a model component introduction operator, which can, for example, quantify over different times a disturbance could occur in a system, which would be one approach to using a, a model checking approach to handle different interrupts. I guess my question is slightly different. So suppose, for example, you could press different keys on your on your incubator, right? Mm -hmm. And then uh, probably the order, the time of those keys matter a lot uh, for, mm -hmm. for the type of behavior that you see. I, I think then probably you need more like explorative uh, strategy to find out which direction you want to go, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Is that something is you have considered or you, you would like to consider? I think it's not something I've considered in the kind of model checking based approach. So I know there is a lot of work on, say, optimizing or just exploring input spaces for temporal lo logic properties, but no, it's not work. We, not a direction I've considered, but it would be, and I think it would be difficult to combine it with the kind of sound flow star based methods, just because the basic cost of um, doing one experiment is sufficiently high, but I'm sure yeah, this kind of design space or disruption space exploration would be useful in this context. Are there other questions? Um, if there are none, I could ask one more maybe. Uh, so, so, of course, you build your, your approximation using Flowstar in the digital twin, but um, is it... So, so the moments that you you use to to take discrete samples for from the actual system, I guess that those could also be significant in revealing uh, errors. Have you looked into that aspect? So, when to sample the the uh, monitored system to make sure that you maximize the the probability of uh, of uh, falsifying your property? That's not something I've looked at. Um, maybe Claudia can. 
say. Yeah, I can mention a few words here. We are, uh, it's a very good question, Mohammed. We, we, we are unfortunately, uh, we are bounded by the sensors. These are digital sensors. They're very accurate, but each one takes one sec second to get a value out of. So our con the whole system loop is three sec every three seconds we produce data. And that's what we are doing uh, when doing the simulation. So uh, let's put it this way. Uh, the monitor is working at the fastest speed it can monitor and it, it, it corresponds to the fastest speed we can sample the system. <laughs> <laughs> Slower but, than that would probably be worse. You, you may consider the dynamics of your digital twin to decide this is a good moment to sample because it's very likely. Oh, to oh yeah, yeah. That's a very interesting uh, yes for for performance. Uh, that's actually that leads to a very, very interesting research uh, question, wouldn't it? What, what is the minimal amount of, of of sampling you can do to conclude that a certain property is true? We have been recently looking into this problem and formulated some sort of uh, game theoretic version of it, where um, okay. as a sampler you, you are you're playing against the, the system to falsify it, right? Um, uh, we have some theoretical results, some numeric results, but I think there is a lot more to be done. It is early. Uh, it, well, if you if you want a, a more realistic case study, we have this one, but we we also have. Um, this is still considered a toy example. It can be built, you can experiment, it gives you the, the nastiness of the real world to play with, but uh, we, we also have uh, other more complex case studies where, where we intend to apply this technology at some point. Well, I, I'm writing up a draft as soon as it's polished. I will send it along and maybe we can have a chat about it later on. Or, or just directly with Thomas. Thomas is very comfortable with incubator uh, and also he can directly give you give you all the access. Thank you. Uh, okay, are there any further questions? If not, thank you very much. And in two weeks, we'll have another interesting uh, verifiability talk. So see you in two weeks. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Bye. Thanks for organizing this. Bye. All right. Thank you. Thank you.